Zarko Locker, and he's going to talk to you about managing distributed, distributed development. development. Zarko Locker. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to apologize, James, for the broken glass outside. Uh, I got a little carried away. <laughs> no, out of respect for the institution and for Red Monk, uh, I felt it was important not to drink uh, alcohol before giving my talk. But now that I'm giving my talk, I think it would be wholly appropriate. A little liquid courage goes a long way. So, um, also, since I'm speaking, I'm not going to tweet uh, during the talk, but uh, I hope that uh, some of you will tweet during the talk. And in particular, the idea here is to make this interactive. I'm going to go through and talk about a couple of different observations and lessons from people who've done a lot of distributed development, and I'm sure there's people here in the room who've done so. And even though there's a little bit of... Uh, uh, distance between the, the stage and the audience. I hope that you'll just uh, shout out your comments and uh, agree, disagree, give me examples, give me counterexamples. Uh, I think if you want to give bad examples, uh, as appropriate in this conference, uh, those will come from Sun Microsystems. That seems to be a theme. <laughs> but uh, the key thing is that th this notion of distributed development is really something that has taken hold in the open source world um, just for very pragmatic reasons. Um, and there's a little bit of a schism in the corporate world where in many cases it's, it's just considered very weird to do distributed development. So I want to see if we can get a meeting of the minds here. Um, I have posted these slides. They're up on uh, bit.ly slash Zach Monk if you want to uh, uh, tweet that or, or skip ahead and you know, find all the jokes or whatever. Uh, also with me today, I have the uh, general manager of our European uh, division, Matt Price. Matt, put up your hand. Where is he? Somewhere at the back. Stand up. So if you want to get free Zendesk, or if you're looking for a job, uh, uh, Matt is the guy who can set you up with that. Okay. W one of the things that um, uh, Stephen has been on me for a long time is about uh, producing data and sharing that data as a byproduct of what we're doing. Uh, and it's true for many companies. You think, well, we don't have interesting data. We only have 65 million users in 137. Oh, this could be interesting. <laughs> so uh, Zendesk is a customer service uh, cloud-based application, a help desk system, and uh, we, we are very popular. So we actually start crunching the data. And this is for the purpose of creating some benchmark data that we'll, we'll, we'll start publishing on a more routine basis. Uh, but we thought it would be interesting to see what we could find out about uh, customer satisfaction in uh, different countries. And since we're here in the UK, we'll, we'll start with that. Uh, the UK uh, customer satisfaction ratings, as measured by our Zendesk index, is uh, 83%, which I think is pretty darn good. So congratulations to everyone in England. Yay! <laughs> uh, to be beat by uh, Australia at... Uh, 93%, which is pretty impressive. US, 87%, uh, not bad. Uh, um, interestingly enough, Russia comes in at 80% customer satisfaction rating. Who would have guessed if you've ever traveled to Russia? I mean, that hasn't been my experience in Russia, let's put it that way. France, 57%. Yes, and it's a problem. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? You know, nobody really is that concerned about customer service, apparently. But the number one country in customer satisfaction on the Zendesk index, Mike Milinkovic. Let's hear it. Exactly. Ninety-five percent. And maybe it's just because Canadians are unfailingly polite, uh, but we thought that was interesting. If you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend the book, uh, Big Data, Little Penis. <laughs> yes, you can tweet that. <laughs> I don't have pictures of dogs, luckily. So uh, the Hadoop bandwagon, you know, I mean, it's all about that. You know, if it's not in the petabytes, it's not serious. So. So let's start talking about distributed development. No, wait, keep that slide for a while. You, you need that up? Okay. Actually, I made a, a few different fake O'Reilly covers. So uh, they, they actually have a site that makes it very easy. So 
Okay, distributed development. So let's, one of the key things to get a, a, a point that's very important on distributed development is it's not actually any cheaper. Because often you'll hear, uh, maybe it's the classic uh, VP of engineering or CFO saying, can't we just do this offshore and save a lot of money? And, and if you go into it with the idea of it being a, a cost savings, you're probably approaching it the wrong way. And from a management perspective, it's certainly not easier because you're dealing with distributed teams, cultures, time zones, all those issues. But it is absolutely worth it, particularly if you're in a situation where, uh, as in Silicon Valley today, it's very competitive to get talent. In many industries, it's hard to find the right skills. Uh, Zendesk, we happen to use uh, Ruby on Rails as our platform, and uh, MySQL, a lot of this kind of somewhat uh, popular technology, but it's, it's really competitive. And uh, it, it is worth it because you can find, if you can find the right kind of passionate talent who can come in and deliver great results. And we all know that, you know, the average developer productivity is, you know, not that great if you look across all of the entire industry. And Red Monk people, and people who are here are probably by definition way above average, five or 10x productivity gains. And if you, if you find the real superstars, it's another 10x. I mean, it's just in incredible how much talent there is out there, and it's not necessarily all in the same place that you have your business. So we found it to be a, a great thing, and, and you know, it's kind of a continuum. So just uh, a couple points on, on uh, Zendesk. You know, um, a year ago we were about 60 employees, now we're about 160. Uh, we have four offices. We have the office here in, the, in London for Europe. We have a, uh, another office in Copenhagen where we do a lot of development. Uh, that, that's a picture of the, the first crop of the uh, Denmark team. Uh, we have a team in Melbourne and we have a large crew in San Francisco. And the last company I was at was, uh, was MySQL, and that's maybe a, a kind of an extreme outlier in terms of distributed development. Um, by the time we sold this to Sun, it was uh, 400 employees in 40 different countries. Uh, we really only had two offices, and uh, there were approximately zero developers in the Cupertino office, and then we had an office of about, I think, five people in Stockholm. Uh, because we had acquired some technology. So really, the rest of the, the company, uh, certainly the, the rest of the developers, all worked uh, from home, and they were all over the place. You know, it was uh, you know, Australia, it was uh, Germany, it was Munich, it was Moscow, it was uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Chicago, you name it. Uh, we, had, we had people all over the place. And it, 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 part, it partly came from the open source culture where MySQL was created, which was, um, you know, like a lot of uh, open source projects, it had a, a cult following, uh, arguably a cult leader <laughs> in some ways. Uh, but, you know, you had to attract people at that time who were willing to work for, for uh, uh, a crazy visionary CTO, and um, they weren't necessarily all located in, in uh, Finland, where Monty was. Um, so, so we got very good at being distributed really early, and that became kind of the philosophy of development. Hire the best developers we could, regardless of location. Sometimes we even interviewed them. <laughs> there were people hired completely over email. It was kind of remarkable, uh, and it actually did work. I don't recommend that. So let, let's uh, you know, think of yourself somewhere on this continuum. How many people here have some distributed development? Not just work at home, but different time zones. Okay, okay, quite a few. This is not representative of the, of the world at large, so I, hopefully we'll make this into a good dialogue. So I go through like a dozen different principles or ideas from different uh, people. Uh, this first uh, concept is that the tool sets define behavior. And if you think of some of the presentations that were here earlier, you know, if you think about uh, Jenkins, for example, or uh, uh, Cloud Foundry, uh, the way that got published on GitHub, the tools that are used really are key to shaping the behavior. Because often when you run into teams that seem very reluctant to have uh, distributed uh, uh, you know, teammates in other regions or whatever, it's, it, it's in part sometimes influenced by the tools that they've started with. 
And so the, the key notion here is really to uh, make sure that you're making everything glo globally accessible. If it requires that you have to be in the office at HQ to get access to a system or source code, you're really limiting what can be done. And I think, you know, historically, you know, I understand companies that have started, you know, they're coming from that background. But as if, particularly if you're a manager or CTO or you're one of the early people involved in a company, you really got to have to pick the tools that make everything global and public by default. Um, I strongly recommend uh, the, the, the continuous integration tools like Jenkins uh, to, to really get consistency of problems. And one of the things to think about is that the more distance you have, the more you have to think about ways to bridge that distance and have kind of immediate communications. Because if you're used to having people down the hall, you just walk down the hall if you get sufficiently pissed off about something and you say, hey dude, you left me off this message or you know, I need to have access to this system or that system or whatever. And if you don't have people down the hall, then if it ends up being this 24-hour cycle on email back and forth, it just leads to a lot of uh, frustration. So you want to think about ways to shorten that distance through immediacy and through communications channels that require immediate attention. Uh, Mark de Visser is Dutch. Uh, he's the gentleman pictured there. His favorite beer, no surprise, it's Grolsch, which is a, a good to middling uh, uh, Dutch beer. We're not evaluating his beer choice, but wouldn't be my first choice, so, okay. Uh, next notion up is really as you start new projects, think about how to be distributed from the very beginning. And even if you're not doing an open source project, think of it as open source. Think of it, how would you make it accessible to everyone? And I think that there, there's a whole generation of tools, whether it's uh, GitHub or Launchpad or others, which just change the defaults to being one of providing broad access and making it open rather than I got to be in the building. Um, you should also think of the quality of what you're doing. And I think there was a great point made, uh, and I can't remember which talk, but it was that uh, from, from uh, KK on, on Jenkins, but it was the notion that the, the plugins and other interfaces, the APIs that you should, you should use, there shouldn't be a distinction between what's used externally from third parties and what's used internally. If you really make things fully open with APIs, there's, there's not that big of a distinction. And it kind of forces you to, be, to make your product architecture very open, uh, which is a good thing. And it's going to make it easier to, to collaborate and carve off different projects. Uh, this is kind of funny, but uh, Bob's advice here was uh, to make sure that you're actually documenting uh, check-ins at much like you deal with in Twitter, you know, you're not trying to write a novel of uh, three paragraphs or, or four pages on everything you've checked in, but you, you've got to put more than uh, uh, three words in there also. Think of it as a, a tweet stream. How do you make that uh, information meaningful and, so that people will, a short enough process so that people will put some commentary there so later when you're trying to dig through those logs, you know what, exactly what got checked in. And his observation was that sometimes there's, there's social tools that, you know, if your team doesn't absorb those and doesn't gravitate and use them, you may just not be able to use them yet. So some, some organizations take to uh, Twitter or IRC or Yammer or Chatter, et cetera, and some organizations don't, and it's hard to force them to do it. Uh, Bob's uh, favorite beer, uh, Newcastle Brown, uh, totally side with that one. Uh, this next one is a comment from uh, Steve Wilson, who was at Sun for many years. Uh, he was part of, he managed NetBeans for a period of time and uh, stepped into a very difficult situation. Uh, NetBeans uh, team was originally in uh, Czech Republic and um, a lot of mistrust between the, the team and the management at Sun and maybe this view that if you weren't in Menlo Park, then what the hell were, were you doing? These are just a bunch of you know, beer drinking, open source Czech fanatics, which is true, but, but it didn't mean they, they couldn't do the, they weren't doing the right stuff. But what he found is there was actually just a need to have much greater transparency. And this is something to keep in mind if you find yourself running a remote team or you're a remote 
participant is really the onus is on you to publish in a much more transparent way. Because there's sometimes this fear people have, you know, there's a team that's out of sight, what the hell are they working on? You know, we haven't heard from them in days or weeks or months. And the best way to counter that is just to err on the side of being uh, totally transparent and over communicating. And in, in, in Steve's case, what he found was that while the verbal skills weren't always there, and people, developers whose native language is not English may not be comfortable in conference calls, speaking up, etc., that uh, you got to find somebody in that group who has great written communication skills, presumably in English if that's the you know, natural language of, of the rest of the team, and just make sure that they're communicating all the time on their decisions and what they're doing. Not at a, a micromanagement level, but just keeping people up to date on architectural decisions, uh, processes, etc. And then let that team make the decisions of, regarding tools and architecture, etc. that make sense for that team. It's not necessarily going to be the same things that, that other organizations are going to use elsewhere. Any comments so far? I can't see any hands. Well, we had way more interaction when we were in uh, the last conference, so. But the beer was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, we'll keep going for a little while. Okay, uh, this is an expression, uh, Swedish expression, uh, lagom ar bast. Does anyone know what that means? It's close. Beer is best, no. Uh, it's uh, the right amount is best. It's kind of a Swedish expression. It sort of means, you know, how much should you overmanage? How much should you modularize? Well, just the right amount. And what it really means is think about how to modularize your code so that you can have separate teams or individuals working in areas and not getting in each other's shorts and messing things up. So much like in the earlier talk, you know, finding uh, a dish that somebody can, can prepare or a team can work on that's not going to create a lot of uh, overhead and excessive communication uh, between teams. The best way that we found to uh, organize teams uh, at MySQL was by module and by time zone. So and if you can have a team all operating within two to three hours of time zone, that's pretty good. If you have time zone, country, you know, people on, uh, in different continents and you've got seven to eight hours between them, okay, there's some overlap, it's not great, it can work. As soon as you get to three continents, it is really hard. And we've you know, learned that the hard way and you sort of wonder, well, why would you do that? Well, we had a great developer in Australia, we had a great team over here, we had a great team in Europe and in the US. Suddenly now, you just can't get everybody together all at the same time. So you really have to think about how to organize by, uh, by time zones. Uh, Thomas is actually the, uh, the, the manager. He still actually works on uh, MySQL. He's a fantastic manager. Uh, he's, he's like the Ur engineer that uh, uh, Brian, uh, those guys were talking about earlier, uh, really helped, has helped in, in the last year or so to in, improve the performance of MySQL by, by having really great integration with InnoDB, uh, something that's, that's helped out a lot with performance. And his point is, you really have to have these short, iterative development tests and integration cycles. And that where projects go wrong, especially distributed projects, is you have different teams going off and working on stuff, and months and months and months go by, and then they try to bring it all together. And you know how it is, like, well, we don't really have time to do three alphas and two betas and whatever, so we'll just do a few less uh, integrations effectively, and you just can't make up for that in the end. The, the longer you delay these integration cycles, the harder it is to actually bring these modules back together again. Uh, well, what, th what we found, and part of Thomas's advice was, uh, you got to get people together face-to-face -to -face routinely. And it's kind of interesting because when I uh, first, uh, like I, I, I originally ran marketing inside of MySQL, and then I got asked to run engineering for a while. And you know, if, uh, I'm, a, oh, I'm a pretty good product guy, but if the marketing guy gets asked to run engineering, it's not because things are running smoothly. 
<laughs> there were some issues to deal with. There was a lot of cleanup, right? So I go over my first couple of weeks, uh, I get over to Stockholm, I meet Thomas, he's got a small team there, and he says, Zach, you know, all this distributed stuff, it's a bunch of bullshit. Okay, great. <laughs> That's the starting position. Uh, but over time, he actually started to see the value of leveraging these different teams and making it work together. But the key thing is, you have to get people face-to-face -to -face together at the start of a project. And typically what we found was, uh, you got to get people together about every six months. And sometimes we would just get together in a place like this with uh, all the engineers, and there, there'd be a couple of lightning talks, and then it'd be like, okay, now we're off and coding and doing a sprint or doing an integration, just like a normal company where the people are just like sitting right next to you. It was so cool because we didn't do that very often. So it was a, a great way to get uh, that burst of productivity and connective tissue between individuals across different uh, geographies. And then we'd all disperse for six months or more, and then you could still make uh, tremendous progress. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of, um, this is advice that comes from Adrian McDermott, who's the VP of Engineering at Zendesk. And he's really more of a uh, uh, scotch drinker than, uh, than, than a beer drinker. But, but whatever they're ser serving at the Buddha bar in Copenhagen, I think he'll, he'll drink that. So when, we do, when they do the monkey gras uh, in Scotland with the Glenlivet, Adrian's your man. Uh, so his key finding is that as you bring in new people, you got to get them up up and uh, set up all their setup, their systems, their tools, their access, and fixing bugs as fast as possible. Even if it's a trivial, easy bug to get in and fix, you want to do that fast. Typically, he's aiming to get them up and, and doing that within two days. So a new employee signs on, wherever they are, it's Copenhagen or as far away you know, as uh, Berkeley, that's a joke. Um, you know, we get them in the office next, next week, coding, integrating, checking in stuff, and making, making things happen. The other thing we do is we actually assign them ticket duty in their first week. We, not only do we do that for all engineers, we do that for all employees at Zendesk. Because, you know, our, our software is a help desk system, and we want everybody to, to, to be using it all the time and get used to providing great service. So we get them doing that, and then typically we pair up developers with other developers in the, in the company so that they always have somebody they can go ask dumb questions of. Because, you know, you get new, new employees, they're, 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 and it, this is really important when they're distributed, is you can have people who just get lost on a basic thing that they're not really sure of, and if they don't feel comfortable asking a question, weeks can go by where they're just spinning their wheels doing something the wrong way, or they didn't know someone else is working on that or someone else has solved that problem or we have a tool for it. And if you're a young company, maybe it's not all written down. So you, we really want to get that uh, uh, dialogue happening. We use a lot of uh, software tools to help in this area of collaboration. So Trellio, uh, Pivot Tracker, we use those as Kanban boards, basically as an electronic way of posting what we're doing uh, instead of post-it notes. Uh, we also maintain a uh, private kind of in-house developer channel. Um, we standardized on IRC and Flowdoc and Yammer and Ripple. <laughs> so there's lots of different tools. And you know, again, it's, it's, the developers really like uh, IRC, so that's what they want to use. Uh, we also used uh, kind of Yammer across uh, other organizations in the company. Uh, and it's a little uh, convoluted, but uh, you know, it works for us. So one of the uh, other ideas here, this comes from uh, David Champagne, a uh, longtime developer. He was at, uh, a manager at SPSS and then at uh, Revolution Analytics. They have the uh, open source R uh, statistics language I think Steve is uh, familiar with. And what he basically does is forces a daily 15-minute scrum you know, at all times uh, and basically make sure that you're breaking stuff up into small teams so that people can really have this kind of communication. And it gets harder when you've got uh, different time zones. So uh, in the worst case, if you've got people that really in uh, far away conditions, we try to do it once a week. And uh, whatever communications channels work, whether it's Skype, chat, 
uh, SMS, etc. And they also do this mentorship with new people. Uh, this is some advice from uh, Jeffrey Pugh, an awesome VP of engineering I've worked with. And he's, uh, he's uh, uh, a Kiwi uh, from New Zealand, so he, and he uh, tends to be a little cynical and jaded. And he says, you know, if you leave developers alone, they always assume the worst. So his point is, as a, this is really for a manager, if you're a VP or a manager of developers, you got to spend 50% of your time communicating internally, following up with developers, taking their pulse, and just seeing how they're doing. Because the, the, the thing that can really hurt a project is, you know, you get to a critical juncture, you're halfway, three quarters of the way through, and the developer says, you know, I'm fed up, I can't take this any, anymore, I'm, I'm leaving. And it's like, what, why didn't you ever say anything? And a lot of people just aren't wired that way. Some people are wired that way too much. Um, but, you know, you want to touch in with, check in with people and just see how they're doing. So his point is to speak to a different uh, developer every day. If you have a small team, obviously that's not a big deal. We got to the point where we had, you know, well over 100 developers in all these different locations. So, um, you know, just speaking to somebody every day uh, takes up a, a, a fair amount of time. Uh, he's a big fan of using uh, Confluence for sharing ideas or other wiki tools. And one of the things that, that he always tried to do is, Make sure you're never more than a couple of weeks away from something that's demoable. And if you, you've been in a small company and you've, you've had a, a, a real push to get to a demo version or some big presentation at a conference or a board of directors meeting or a funding thing or whatever, you know how much work takes place to get that to happen and how many bugs and errors you find during that process. So if you, if you just keep that kind of tight rhythm on things, uh, that goes a long way towards making sure that teams have not gotten too far uh, astray. And uh, uh, I don't know, people use video conferencing in, in your organizations? Quite a few. I, I, I personally like Skype uh, video. I think it works pretty well. Other tools are, are great. Uh, Jeffrey's view is he just hates trying to have video conferences because there's always, like, it's always three in the morning for somebody and nobody wants to look at somebody in their boxers coding away or whatever. So, you know, different, uh, different philosophies. Um, this is a, a buddy of mine, uh, Rob uh, Castaneda. Um, he's a, a founding member of the Electric Buddha Blues Band. Uh, it's pretty much the two of us. <laughs> he's the talented one. <laughs> he's an awesome guitar player. And uh, what... He does a lot of, uh, they do a, a SAS uh, class registration system. They do a lot of consulting work uh, in conjunction with Atlassian and Zendesk and other companies. And one of the things he's found is he's got people in, 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 in I think, five or six different countries. And, and the key thing that he looks for is maximizing overlap or the efficiency of the overlap with time zones. I mean, there's only a few hours a day where he's got overlap with his team in Australia or Malaysia, et cetera, and he's, a, he's in California. And therefore, encourage people to be military precise in their communications. Every communication should have exactly the information that you need to resolve the issue. Don't assume that the receiver has the information. If, if you're commenting on a bug, put the friggin' bug number right there in the email. If it's a customer, put the customer ID from Salesforce. Put whatever links or you know, links to tickets or JIRA incidents or whatever so that somebody has all the information they need. Because if you forget to do that, a couple hours go by, now you're outside the window of communication, you're gonna lose basically 24 hours to resolve an issue. And this is something that is, you know, it's sort of obvious in a way, but it's obvious in a way that's clear not many people really do this. And I see all the time messages where it just doesn't have all the information you need. So he, he really makes sure that he gets his developers in early in the morning to maximize the overlap, and then they can kind of go off and, and be gone for a couple hours midday as necessary. And they, they also have gotten to this mode of having an apartment He's got an apartment in Malaysia, he's got an apartment in Palo Alto, he's got an apartment in Sydney, so that when they can encourage developers to come and stay in country for weeks or months at a time and not feel like they're imposing or that they're having to live out of a hotel or something like that. 
and effectively takes the cost out of the, or at least part of the travel cost out of the equation. And it's actually kind of a, a nice way to, uh, for certain, for, for people particularly who are younger, maybe have the flexibility to go work in another country. It's a tremendous perk for these guys. And they love the idea that they can go work somewhere else for, for a period of time. Rob doesn't drink beer. I don't understand that. Uh, so he, he, he drinks this other Mexican soda. I don't even know what it is, but it's, it's really awful. Uh, the guys at Atlassian, they know how to drink beer, so uh, from, from Mike and Scott, uh, they're all about publishing the metrics, you know, the wall boards, etc. Uh, some companies like this, some companies don't, but having the uh, hall of shame, you know, who's broken the build, you know, up on a big screen in a room, that, that's a good uh, incentive for people to fix things. Having uh, all the latest bug counts, etc., very transparent, so that no matter which office you're in, you know, in their case, they have teams in, in uh, three different countries. They can see exactly what's going on. And uh, they use a lot of two-way instant messaging for, for their tools. So their tools will tell you, you, you can hook it up so it sends you a message when something works or doesn't work, build status, etc. And you can also issue commands uh, remotely because, you know, we've all got cell phones and, and uh, devices and stuff like that. So you shouldn't have to be at your desk to make things happen. Um, this is another uh, MySQL guy, Gary Wizen, uh, this guy I worked with back in the Borland days also. Uh, he was uh, the manager on, the, uh, he was Anders Heilsberg's manager on Turbo Pascal going back to uh, version 1.0 and all the Delphi releases. That's what, back when they did distributed development, uh, Philippe Kahn would just put a disk on Gary's desk and say, okay, this is what we're shipping. It'd be like, where the hell did that come from? He was pretty sure Philippe did not write the early versions of Turbo Pascal, but he didn't know where they came from. And it was actually Anders toiling away in, in uh, Denmark doing it. Um, and his, he has an analogy of, you know, if, if you have a friend come over and they say, hey, I'm going to make you uh, dinner at your house, and they dirty this pot and they dirty that pot and they dirty this other thing, and by the end of the evening, you have a friggin' mess on your hands in the kitchen. And it's like, great, I'm so glad this person made dinner, and now I have to clean up this entire mess. Keep the kitchen clean as you go. Clean up your mess. Somebody breaks a build, fix it immediately. Always keep that pressure and kind of have these ever-expanding concentric circles of testing. You, you, you can't necessarily afford to do a full end-to-end uh, -end test on every single uh, check-in that happens. But as you get to certain milestones, you want to have more rigorous testing and, and make more stuff happen. We have a question? Uh, I think to, 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 to follow that goal, you have to really have a, a clean environment because you've got to get, to get someone to find who break, who, who broke it. And to find out, you must know why is that it breaks. And uh, then you've done a thorough analysis already. So basically, you need the tools to, to connect that and do some different integration. Yeah, I think that's a really good point on continuous integration. Other comments on this topic? Steven? Yes? yes? Okay. <laughs> okay, tweet that. Steven Wiley says yes. Okay, excellent. Um, his, his other point is around QA, that sometimes you get these QA teams that want to put in all kinds of obscure corner case testing. And it's like, you know, the first thing, test to make sure that the software does what it's supposed to do rather than just the corner, the failure cases. Test correctness of, of proper behavior and then look for the corner cases afterwards. Uh, he's a big fan of Selenium and other uh, automatic testing. Okay, uh, this is kind of my per personal advice uh, in managing a, a distributed team and it's, it's more social. It's get on a plane, break bread and drink beer with the guys. You got, I, I know it sounds hard. <laughs> you have to get out there and build the culture in the field where your developers are. And if you've got a remote team, you can't expect people to come to headquarters all the time. In fact, you, you have to get on a plane and travel to them because it's, it's, it's only when you get to their turf, their environment, you know, it, it, maybe it's their favorite pub or their restaurant, their culture that you really start to understand and get inside their heads and understand how they live. And then suddenly, many technical issues are much, much easier to solve because you're sitting on the same side of the table and have a common reference point. Uh, that, that picture is actually me, uh, uh, Kai Arno, 
uh, Monty Vidanius and a couple other MySQL guys doing what's known as a negative sauna. Does anyone know what a negative sauna is? You know what a sauna is, right? Sauna is hot. What's a negative sauna? It's a friggin' cold sauna. <laughs> so you go in there and it goes to, I think it was uh, negative 110 degrees Celsius. That's negative 166 Fahrenheit. Slightly colder than outside the uh, brewing company last night. <laughs> uh, but you go into these rooms successively, you go from negative uh, 20, negative 40, negative 80, negative uh, 110. And um, you're in there in your skivvies and maybe a hat if you were smart. And you're there with uh, five close friends <coughs> singing uh, Halen Gars, singing Swedish drinking songs to keep warm. And it's such a cold environment that by singing, it actually, the moisture that gets produced, it starts snowing <laughs> and it gets foggy and you can't actually see anymore. And you, you, like you literally can't see the end of your hand. And they only put you in there for a few minutes, and then you're like, shit, where is everybody? <laughs> and you, had, you know, for me, it's like, I hope I don't get stuck in here, <laughs> get locked in. But it, it worked out okay. And then you go back through the warmer rooms, and then you get into minus 60, and it's like, wow, that's balmy. <laughs> Anyways, it's, um, it's a weird kind of team building, but if you're in the Finnish culture, you know, that's, that's what you do to prove yourself to be as studly as... You know, the, the, the stud list of the best. So anyways, uh, who would have thought that that can help uh, ensure good management of projects? But so, OK. Uh, this is uh, some advice from uh, Martin Mikos. Martin was my boss at MySQL. Uh, phenomenal leader. He's, he's now on the board of directors of Nokia, which I think is awesome. Yeah, he brought us some fucking Lumias, and one of them has already disappeared. <laughs> So uh, somebody please tweet at Martin Mikos and thank him for the Lumias and ask him to send a few more. Yes. Um, but uh, Martin's view is when you go distributed, you got to go all in. You got to be distributed about everything. And you know the culture that, that he tried to set was really that there was no central, there was no one time zone, there was no one culture. It was not a company that was being run from headquarters. And Martin's kind of a, a man without a country because he's a Swedish-speaking Finn, so like uh, Linus Torvalds, so in a minority group inside of uh, Finland, living in Silicon Valley, a very foreign place for him. And so he's dealing with all these different cultures. And as a result, everything we, we set up was assume distributed, assume different cultures, and never make a dependency on a single viewpoint uh, that, that gets reflected from a culture. Everything we did, we put online. And it was not just the technical side of things. It was also about putting your personality online. That IRC or other things were, yes, there was, uh, obviously use that for work communications, but it was also about putting social interaction online. And this was before we had Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. Although those guys were all customers of MySQL. Uh, but it was really about um, living and breathe, breathing that distributed environment. And if you could hire people in their, in their local place where they, they live, they would be happier. They'd be happy because they could be a part of a, a big team, a successful organization, and they'd be more productive. So I think, uh, you know, just think about not just the process issues and technical issues, but how do you, as a manager or a developer, have your personality out there? And sometimes you'll see crazy shit go down from developers on IRC channels or email or whatever. It's like, you have to let that happen. You have to engineer so that's okay. You have to have public water cooler conversations and gossip and all this weird stuff because that happens in the real world. So it has to have a home in the online world also for it to work. So, um, you know, I, I kind of have this view that says distributed development is awesome, but it has a lot of caveats to it. You know, you're not really going to save money on salaries and rent because you're, you're going to blow it on travel. You know, you're, you're going to recruit globally, but that's actually uh, very hard to do. And then you end up dealing with German labor laws and 
you know, uh, Australian pension funds and all kinds of stuff that you never wanted to know about. It works great for senior developers, but junior developers sometimes completely wash out in a distributed environment because they don't necessarily have the, the, the maturity to put up their hands if things are going wrong. You get 24 by 7 productivity. You know, you can send something to another team and they'll work on it overnight. The bad news is you, you get 24 by 7 demands on your time. You know, so there, there's really opposite pluses and minuses to all of this, but I actually think it is the best way to find talent. And people who have worked in a distributed environment generally, you know, they love it and they hate it. And the thing that they love is they can go, they can be at their house or, or a remote office, they can make stuff happen and be extremely productive and not get caught up in a bunch of BS meetings that they don't want to be a part of. They get to do the thing that they like doing, which is coding. And that the hard part is it can be a lonely kind of thing. So you have to think about ways to bring them together. So some of the tools that uh, you know, I, I've mentioned here, you know, there's a whole range of tools. There's all kinds of them. Um, and I'll just say, my, you know, my favorite beer, uh, it used to be Fat Tire. But I think as a result of uh, uh, Monktoberfest, I've been educated. And I would say uh, Brooklyn Brewing Company, uh, Blue Apron Ale, I don't know if that meets your... Good enough? Okay. It was 25 bucks a bottle at the French Laundry, so it, it, it better be good. <laughs> no, it's a, it was a very good beer, so... Um, and the last thing I want to mention is uh, Zendesk. Uh, we, we've, we've made this thing uh, available, so if anyone wants Zendesk for free, if you make a $20 donation to a charity, the UCSF... Um, uh, hospital in San Francisco, then you get Zendesk for free. Uh, so that's our kind of gift.